Welcome to another edition of the GM Files, Jim Duquette alongside Bobby Evans. And this week we are welcomed by former major leaguer for the New York Yankees, Toronto Blue Jays. He was drafted by the San, San Diego Padres, played for the Miami Marlins, Florida Marlins then, but the Florida Marlins World Series title with the New York Yankees. Homer Bush joins us. Homer, nice to see you. Thanks for the time today. I, I want to get right into this because we have a lot to ask you about, right? And your football career as a high schooler in football, you still have two, as far as we know, you have two high school records that still stand today in the state of Illinois, right? Most uh, touchdowns as a wide receiver uh, in a season and most yards uh, caught, right, uh, for for a wide receiver in a season. Those are two. And I know you had a potential to play college football as well. Take us through that and how much that maybe helped you in baseball and were you ever close to maybe trying the two sports in college? Absolutely. Um, so it all started with, first of all, we had a powerhouse football program. And so I could play a little bit and we had a, uh, a famous high school coach in Robert Shannon. So he was, a uh, you know, nationally known. And so I could play a little bit and, but you know, back then what the cool kids did right <laughs> so I really went out initially because all my friends went were, were playing and so uh it just worked out where coach he was like hey if you work a little bit extra I think you can do big things in this game and so uh, I would go in in the mornings catch passes and he brought something out of me that I didn't even know I had in me right wow. uh so uh you know I, I did that and end up breaking those state records and uh, I actually did think that was going to be my path into college because, you know, my mom, uh, you know, was eight kids. There's no way she was going to pay for, you know, we, you know, it's going to pay for college education. So it was like, all right, well, I'll use this as my way to get a free education, if, if nothing. And then the draft comes along. So now I got options, but I had played baseball ever since I was, you know, a little short. And so um, it was a tough decision, but like I said, you know, my mom was, you know, raising a lot of kids. So the, 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 the bonus didn't hurt. Right. So that, 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 that weighed my decision. Big time. That's awesome. Well, the, the, the Padres was a great organization to get drafted by, you know, cause there would be opportunity, obviously that, you know, didn't go necessarily as planned, but what, what was it like in the Padre organization at that time? I mean, that was uh, early nineties. That was really even before towers became the GM. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, as you can imagine, extremely difficult. Uh, um, you know, as Jim mentioned, how did uh, playing high school football help me um, when I got into baseball? Well, I'll never forget this one story. I tell this to my son quite often. I almost quit high school football because it was really too difficult. It, I mean, man, you're banging your body around. But more importantly, this one particular day, I think was kind of like was the straw was going to break the camel's back or should have. And um, we had to run like these uh, sprints, but we, I used to run with the quarterbacks and the running backs and the receivers, of course, and all these guys were on the track team. They were, so they based the time on their time, not my time. And so, I mean, I just could not make, I think I had to make it in like 30 seconds. You had to run three or four anyway, and then you have to run it for time after that. Well, I could barely make 30 seconds when I was fresh and before practice. Anyway, I'm, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and I'm just crying under my helmet. I'm just like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And I didn't, uh, of course, I didn't get it within 30 seconds. Had to do these rolls. Uh, and man, you know, it just felt sick. And I was like, dude, I'm done. I'm, I'm done with high school football. And my mom was like, no, you're not. Like, dude, that's not how this works, you know? And so I went back out there and this was my sophomore year too. So, I mean, I had, uh, you know, I was fresh into the whole high school football um, arena. So, uh, man, I'm telling you, I should have, um, I, sh I should have walked away, but my mom made me stick to it, stick with it. And so when I got into pro ball, I felt like I was, ready to compete with almost anybody in any situation. Mm. I wasn't going to quit, I, I, right? So it was literally like I was going to get it done because uh, I was not going back to East St. Louis. 
Wow. Well, yeah. that's, I mean, I love those type of stories because we, we always felt that way. I don't know, Bobby, if you guys did in your organization, but we loved two sport athletes that specifically played football because there was a toughness to them, knowing that there was a lot of failure in baseball, as we all know, and that they tended to stick it out a little bit longer when things got tough. Um, and so, like, I always respected guys that like yourself who had that tremendous ability to, to play multiple sports sometimes with basketball baseball we we, we did we did uh, our share of drafting guys that way but football in particular we we um we love you know, grabbing guys that did both of those sports so it's interesting that you that you say that that you felt like it impacted you um i wanted to ask you too because you were i think with the padres uh, even though you were a seventh rounder you were minor league player of the year one year right mm -hmm. then they sent you to australia you you, you led the league and I think the MVP in the Australian league. So, I mean, you had a really good minor league career before you got to the major leagues with the Padres before they, they, they made you, you know, a part of that big trade. Sure. As a matter of fact, as you can tell, uh, that didn't hurt my mindset as I was going through the process. Right. <laughs> right. So I, um, you know, it was just something I had a knack for putting the bat on the ball, you know, and mm -hmm. Man, and I tell you, it's really coming to play in that book and data nowadays where it's showing that uh, you've got to be able to hit outside the strike zone a little bit. Right. If you're going to, you know, increase production in the major leagues, you've got to, um, you know, you got to be able to handle different speeds, location, movements of pitches. And so that's the one thing I was really good at. And so uh, I just had to uh, get better at stealing bases and, and, and work on uh, my defense. You mentioned your book, um, Hitting Low in the Zone. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in that book, you, you, you talk a little bit about the shift, right? Correct. So, um, you know, there is bat ball collision, certain bat ball collision that needs to take place in order to beat the shift. Um, you know, you um, and inside the book, it uh, talks about, you know, uh, you have to be able to... Uh, attack certain pitches in a certain area, not so much in the strike zone, but the hitting zone. Mm -hmm. And if hit it, well, the successful hitters, you're in and you're out, you're in and you're out. When they do that, they're consistently successful. And when they are missing that certain production, um, they have a hard time increasing their volume of uh, production. But at the same time, the guys that focus on pitches outside of that zone usually hit into the shift a lot. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Very good. That is, that is good. I, what, you know, I mean, you were a 285 career hitter. I know you had hip problems that, that, that sidelined your career towards the end, um, but you didn't strike out a lot either. Was that was that like now, you know, there you, see, you see a lot of guys that will just swing and miss and they don't really, doesn't really bother them all that much. Was there a mindset on put, putting the ball in play and making contact, you know, with, uh, during your period of time? I imagine it was. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, um, my agent used to always say, hey, hit 280 play solid defense, steal 32 bases, and you'll make a lot of money in this game, it, <laughs> right? So if right. you think about it, like I'm not focusing on walks, but I'm not focusing on just swinging at anything either. So when I got my pitch, I felt like the more times I swung the bat, that would increase my chances of hitting for a high average. Homer, who, who represented you during your career? Tony Atanasio. Oh, Tony. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Very nice. Been around a long time, right? Yeah, that's right. Tony's that's great. Long time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Jim was speaking to it earlier, but, you know, Brian Sabian used to always tell us, you know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta give the athletes every opportunity because, you know, he didn't, he never wanted to give up on a good athlete because, you know, eventually the, the athleticism, you know, will play. And you had a long stretch, you know, not terribly long, but a, a really decent stretch in the minor leagues before you really got your shot. What was it like to get your first shot uh, at the big league level? And, and what was that day like, that moment like? Who called oh, you? Oh, gosh. Yeah, no, i tell you what, Bobby. Yeah, I have so many awesome stories throughout my career, but this one here was, uh, so when I grew up, my brother was a big Daryl Strawberry, Tim Raines fan, right? And so Daryl was in AAA with us, um, and, you know, I get call, I'm in AAA with Daryl and I get the phone call, you're going to the big leagues. And I'm like, cool. And I'm 
uh, packing my stuff, about to jump in the taxi. Daryl is also jumping in the taxi, heading to the airport. <laughs> no way. So not only did I get my call up, but I can tell, you know, I was pretty cool to tell my brother. Not only was I going to the big leagues, but I'm here with Daryl Strawberry on the play, you know, so, you know, so uh, that was the first cool moment. So this thing, I mean, it went on for like two days. I mean, so many cool things happened, uh, happened to me. Uh, well, I get it. Um, I get to Yankee, old Yankee Stadium. Uh, man, it's just as beautiful as, you know, they, they, you know, they talk about. And, you know, once the game started, you got a chance to see the rowdiness. Uh, I think the Texas Rangers were in town at that time, I believe. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, it was, it was an amazing story. But the only problem was, it's like you're a rookie trying to break in with the team who had just won the World Series the year before. Right. I, had some, I had some work ahead of me, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, all right. So t- t- take us through that because I right, you, you put on the pinstripes. Like you, you know, when you're first drafted by the Padres, a lot of people think, all right, that's going to be my major league team, you know, and you get traded mm-hmm. over not just any team to the Yankees. So what, you know, what was that like? You know, at that point, that was a big trade with, you know, Deki Arabu, you know, was a, was certainly was a high profile pitcher during that period of time, but you're coming over to, to the Yankees is a big part of that uh, uh, deal. Well, did yeah. you feel any any pressure differently? What was it like when you were the first time playing in New York? Definitely pressure. But what I what I can say was that I knew I was out of options. So all I needed to do was stay the course. You see how I kind of used the system to my benefit to make sure I don't get ahead of myself and not get too comfortable. And so uh, and all I had to do was stay healthy there again, hit 280, steal 30 bags and. Uh, but trying to break in with the Yankees was just, that was just ungodly difficult. Like, <laughs> I mean, literally, you, you're thinking like, okay, this is my time to shine. You know, after the 97 season, 98 roll around, I'm out of options. We don't have a, you know, we don't have a real true second baseman. And then we trade for Chuck Knobloch, who's making yeah, six Knobloch. million fish a year after that, right? So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just not looking good for me. But, uh, I, I, you know, so... I knew it was a very fluid situation with the New York Yankees. I just really had to focus on myself. Uh, But that experience uh, prepared me for the opportunity when I did get an opportunity to say, okay. um, And I think you guys will love this story because you may have done this to a couple of young guys where uh, that 25th spot, right? You're looking for either extra outfielder or a utility guy who can do both, right? Yeah. 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 (laughs) So... We in uh, spring training and Joe Torrey uh, says, hey, you going on a trip tomorrow to Cleveland. Uh, we're playing the Indians in Lakeland. Uh, oh, cool, great. And when I get to the stadium, he says, hey, no pressure, but if you show us you can play shortstop, you're going up north with us. It's like, wow. wow. I, I spent seven years in the minors. Now all of a sudden I get one day to make this thing happen, right? <laughs> hey guys, the first two plays, with double, um, so uh, somehow the first guy got on, and then ground ball hit the second. I'm playing shorty feeds me, make the wild errant throw, and it oh. happened shortly after that, probably next inning, if not the exact same inning. As you uh, can imagine, this was early in the game. I'm like, man, I'm going. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> so you know, it, it it ended up working out there, as you can tell. But that was what I was up against. <laughs> What was it like playing for uh, Joe Torre, Homer, Hall of Famer? Yes, sir. Yeah. The way I explain it is like a father playing with his 25 sons. You know, he garners that type of respect, even at that time. You know, he wasn't someone that yelled all the time. He wasn't going to force you to play your best game. Um, You know, and he understood because remember, he failed as a manager early on. And I promise you, I read somewhere where he said, I became a better manager when I got better players. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's true. Right? That so so he true. understood how difficult the game was, but, you know, playing in New York, he knew he had to win. And, um, you know, so it was, it was actually really cool. I mean, it, like, it seemed like everyone just did their job. It was not like, a, a, you know, a young guy was going to jump another young player. You know, it was full of veterans, who had one goal in mind, all Joe had to do was just, you know, just guide the ship, make sure, you know, the thing didn't sink. So, and he did right. that to a T. 
Yeah. You know, I remember when he was first hired by the Yankees too. The the back pages of the papers were just they crushed they crushed the hire. They crushed uh, Mr. Steinbrenner and they call, I think they might have even called him Clueless Joe. You know, and it ends up kind of reversing course, and it was you know completely the opposite when he was there. But I, I wanted to ask you. So ninety eight season, you get you mm-hmm. you're on the team, you're on the roster, and um, you're in the World Series. And that year in particular, it's against your team that drafted you, the Padres. Um, you know, you didn't get any uh, plate appearances, but you were pinch running. You stole two bags and you were, you were a pretty good stolen base guy. You 70, 76% stolen base rate. Um, did, now in those cases that you stole bags in the world series, take us through that. Like, you know, it's nerve wracking. You're not probably part of the game at the moment. You know, now you have to go in and they're expecting you. Were they expecting you to steal the base? Get, take us through some of that. Absolutely. That was my, um, that was my main reason for being there. Um, and if I didn't go after, you know, three pitches, Jose caught now used to say, Hey, you better go. Joe's going to be mad with you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was definitely expected to run. And um, the cool thing about it was being naive, man, it, it helped me be successful because I felt like I could steal off anybody at any given time, max lead, you know, remember back then those power pitchers were big, not very athletic, and not really trying not trying to talk about anybody, right? But they were just big power guys, big donkeys, right? So man, they raised that leg up and I just pew take off. So yeah, but here's what's was funny. The couple of times where I did get in and the at bat came around and I would be on deck swinging the bat thinking, man, I'm about to get this weird series back. And Joe used to go, and both times Joe was like, hey, bushy. And Joe said, he said, hey, I got to take care of, I got to take care, take care of veterans, right? So I totally understood. <laughs> Who pinch hit for you? Which guy? Tim Raines did one, oh, right if yeah. not twice. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So I totally understood. You know, nowadays, nowadays, Homer, when there's a trade, you know, sometimes the, the players know about it before the, the owner, you know, sometimes before the, the manager, because as soon as a rumor starts floating around Twitter, you know, players are getting phone calls or getting text messages. You know, you got traded after that season, you know, to Toronto. And did you have any idea that was coming? Was there any heads up about that? You know, yes, it was. Uh, as a matter of fact, and, and, and if you don't mind, I'm going to go back to the first trade, which is the wildest thing I've ever experienced. I don't know if you remember, but Hideki Rabu had to work out a financial package, but the trade was yeah. announced. So there were times when the temperature was like 60, like 50, 55 degrees. I couldn't play because fear of straining a hamstring. So I was like, I mean, they were handling me with kid gloves. It was the craziest thing. So that went on for a pretty good while, like four weeks. Well, um, but as far as the Toronto deal, yes. As a matter of fact, Cashman and Joe Torrey were so awesome to me in 98. And you know, as a young guy, uh, I'd had some success at the plate. So they was like, man, you probably you probably get somewhere where you can play because you know everybody knew it wasn't going to happen there. Well, uh, Cashman, you know, I think uh, I want to say I was in Tampa training a couple weeks prior. You know, hey, you know, it had already been publicized that it was going to be uh, it was getting close. Roger wanted to come to New York, and the Yankees wanted him, and the I was actually the piece they wanted. Um, because they wanted a second baseman that could step in and fill, fill the void for Rob, you know, um, you know, that Robbie, the boy Robbie had left. So uh, I did know, uh, but there again, when you're moving millions of dollars, hall of fame type players and, mm-hmm. you know, David Wells was no slouch, you know, he performed well for us in 98. And so, um, you know, it was, I, I think it took him a while to, uh, to do the deal, but, I was, I did know that Gordash was a fan of a big fan of mine and he wanted me in Toronto. You had a good year that year. To, you know, to, I mean, to, so you go to New York and then you thought you were going to be the second baseman that they bring in now black. Now you're going to Toronto replacing, you know, a future hall of famer and Al- Alomar. And you had, a, like you said, you had your 32 bags that you stole, right? You <laughs> hit, uh, over 300. So there you go. So, but I mean, so, you know, when now that you got the opportunity, take us through how that, that must have felt great to here you are in the major leagues and you're finally getting the, the bass that you, you had hoped. Yes. As a matter of fact, um, I, I definitely used that carpet to my advantage. 
uh, especially that old school, you know, yeah, concrete right. slab, right? And so it was literally like, get myself something um, I can get on the ground. And, you know, it's a uh, totally different mindset, you know, than today's game, but uh, that helped me out a lot. Um, and so uh, the cool thing about um, that experience was that I had a ton of young guys around me that were still trying to figure this thing out themselves. Now, you did have guys like Delgado, Sean Green, that was a bit more advanced. But for the most part, you know, it was myself, uh, Shannon Stewart, um, Jose Cruz Jr. I mean, we were Alex Gonzalez. I mean, we were really yeah. just trying to find our way. And that was awesome. Uh, but as you can imagine, being that high, high uh, spot with the Yankees and winning the World Series and having all those mm -hmm. ad veteran knowledge around me. Um, it was tough to lose that, you know, and that was kind of, I guess that was my crutch for a while, but for some reason, uh, I think the first half I hit like 280 and then the second half I hit like 340 and wow. it just got comfortable. Um, and, and I, one thing I can say, and I talk about it, uh, a lot with, uh, hitting guys, people think you make a living on the fastball, man, that's crazy. Like I was a... <laughs> Uh, seven, eight, nine hole guy. And man, I got more sliders and change ups than the four hole hitter did, or just as many. So, man, I'm, I promise you, I learned how to hit the off speed that year. Uh, I mean, like, as if, like, man, this is what you need to do if you're going to survive at the, at the major league level. Who was who your hitting coach that year in Toronto? Do you remember? Yeah, Gary Matthews. Uh, oh, very good. Yeah. Go. Yeah. yeah. Former Giant. Yeah, yeah. Sarge, Sarge was the man. And let me tell you, Sarge would say to me, man, dude, you're the man. Like, man, go out there and handle your business. You know, like, man, he was not letting me allow that opportunity to overwhelm me. I mean, nice. He was, I mean, he was tough cookie, man. He was old school, you know? Now, would you say that year was, was, was what started the core of your book or was it or was it the span of time was it or was it that year that played a lot of influence no it was the next year that played a lot okay. of influence because um i didn't walk a lot so mm. everyone was starting to get into this cheap um uh production uh homer doesn't walk a lot right so it was like hey man you know you did great but if you can get those walks up to 50 you know, I think I walked 20 some times, 19, 20 times yeah. that year. You can get, you know, 25, 30 additional walks, man. Your on base percentage would be 370 or whatever. And so what I noticed was that, um, you know, I stopped, I stopped swinging at the first pitch fastball. I was getting behind a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, not only that, I was trying to make the pitcher get the ball up. And you know mm -hmm. what? It's not getting up. It's not coming up. Like I'm telling you, <laughs> they're going, that's their safe haven. And so the next year, when I got back to being Homer Bush, I think I hit like almost 400 for the first month. And it's wow. all because I swung at pitches that was breaking down outside of the strike zone. And nice. so, you know, but no, great question. I appreciate you uh, asking that. That's a good one. Oh, oh, one. So, oh, one, you got back hitting over 300 that year. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then take us through as, as your, at the end of that Toronto stint, what ends up happening? You end up going, you going on to Florida, uh, for, for a bit there, but take us through what happened towards the end there in Toronto. Well, um, I think JP Richardi came in, which was a mm -hmm. Billy Bean disciple, um, big money ball guy, high on base. And I was just going to be too expensive. You know, I was definitely someone he could, you know, could, could let go and replace easily. Yeah. Um, so, and that's another thing, you know, that, that got me to wondering like, okay, like I'm not going to have my son, you know, get an opportunity to play and have walks impact his career. And so mm -hmm. When I got into the data, it became extremely clear to me, like, okay, there's three areas, the top, middle, bottom, you can't walk in the middle. And the bottom is where everybody get the most opportunities. So you need to make better decisions down there and increase your swing rate and, and you know, be um, 
you know, be good at moving those pitches. But if you take the high fastball a lot, you now can get the pitcher behind and you can bring him down. Mm -hmm. But if you chase the high fastball early on, they put you away with the pitch down below. So I started studying the final um, pitch outs per at bat. And sure enough, you know, they get you out down where you need to be most productive. So that's, uh, so yeah. basically, uh, basically it was the money ball, um, you know, new thing that came on scene and yeah. Um, that that hurt me a lot. Like, cause I, I think I hit 300 that next year. That, that I hit 300 year before, and yeah. when I came back to spring training the next year, they told me I didn't have a uh, I didn't have a position. Nice. Yeah, only because yeah. of walks. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, give me give me a few. So you played with some good good players right along the way. You know, obviously, Yankees, Blue Jays. You you the, some really good young talent give us a couple of guys that stand out, but best players, best players, maybe you play with the Yankees uh, and then with Toronto, some of the, maybe the good young players. I tell you what, uh, <laughs> I would say um, quite naturally, Jeter is an easy pick, right? So, you know, but, <laughs> you know, at that time, remember he was only like three years in, right? right. So yeah, well, right. when I came back in 04, he was a superstar at that point. Like, I mean, as a teammate, you couldn't even get his phone number. It was literally every, he was he was, he was off the charts. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> but um, I still think Shannon Stewart is probably one of the most talented ball players I've ever played with. I mean, this kid, I mean, this yeah, young man was amazing. I mean, um, I mean, he was built like an action figure. <laughs> I mean, uh, fast, uh, strong. Uh, of course, he has some things he, you know, need to work on just like everybody else. But I thought he was a unique talent. Um, and um, gosh, I know I'm pretty sure I'm leaving some people off. But uh, what I can say is Chris Carpenter and Roy Halladay came on big time late in their career. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, man, well, I would yeah, say at the peak sure. of their careers, they can't, man, they got hot at the right time. And man, those guys did well for themselves. And, um, you know, it, it's showing. So, um, and of course, Delgado, I tell you what, Sean, Ra Raul Mondesi, Sean Green, like, man, I'm telling you, I could just go on and on. But <laughs> So many good players there during that time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. I, I can't remember. I don't know if it was 01 or 2000. We were in first place in the AL East in like June or July. And eventually Boston and New York walked us down. But like, I, I remember this vividly because the 60 game season that just took place tells me nothing because mm -hmm. we were a hundred games in, in first place and still sure. got walked down. Right. And <laughs> so that's, you know, there's a lot of um, expectations going forward with some teams who had some success over that season. But I have to be honest with you, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know. I think some people are going to find themselves because you are who you are in baseball, especially after 150, 160 games, right? No doubt. No doubt. Well, that's why they're pushing, I guess, for 162 this year. Hopefully the, the, there'll be fans in the stands at some point to enjoy it. Um, so what about coaches wise, you know, coaching wise? I mean, did, uh, you mentioned Gary Matthews, obviously Joe Torrey, but anybody else that really look back on and say they really made a uh, huge impact? Oh man, Cito Gaston, guys, I have to tell you this, 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 you know, I, I had some tough times in Toronto and I'm not trying to rehash those, you know, they're just some managers, don't like certain players, some right? It's just what it is. Right. But Cito Gaston came into my life at a time on the coaching staff when I needed him the most. And yeah. I mean, here's a man who just came in and they was the, in 98, uh, 99, they honored him. And I'm in the dugout just chilling because man, I had never met him before. And I'm in awe just like, you know, just like everybody else. And he walked up to me and, he, and he, I just remember he, he was, Pointing his finger in my chest. He was like, I'm gonna tell you something, young man. I love watching you play. You whatever you're doing, you just keep doing that, and man, you're gonna be fine. And man, I'm telling you, I needed that bad. And so he impacted me like um in in a in a way where mentally he kept me on straight now. You know, when you feel like you're fighting everybody, 
and then somebody like this come into your life, it's just like, okay, I'm safe. Yeah. I'm safe for at least for a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, and I tell you what, um, man, I was never coached by Mickey Rivers, but he used to come to spring training. Man, I love being around, I love being around Mickey Rivers. You know, you look at Mickey Rivers and man, he just makes you feel like a homeboy. Like, like, man, like, man, if I can do it, you can do it. What, what, what's so difficult about this, man? Just get in there and put the ball in play, you know? So, um, and, 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 uh, gosh, Willie Randolph, um, wow. gosh, I'm telling you guys, I, I've, I've run across some really good people in baseball. And I tell you what, some it, along the way, they all drop some nuggets on me. Sure. Yeah. What I find interesting, Homer, uh, and thanks for sharing those, um, is those were guys that they weren't your everyday coaches. They had, like, you're talking about an impact on Seal Gaston, who he was around the team a little bit, but, but you know, to you don't see a lot of teams. I think the Giants did a really good job of it. I tried to do sure. it with the Mets, where we tried to bring in guys from the past that wanted to be around the team that could catch an ear of a player or, you know, and, and just pass on knowledge, pass on whatever it was. And it was a little thing, like you mentioned with Cedo or Mickey rivers, or whatever, what in it, and it struck you. And I, and I am not quite sure we're, we quite see that these days uh, yet, you know, where, where there, the, some of the veteran guys that used to play are welcome back to the organization. Some organizations still do a good job of it, but it, it seems like it's less, um, these days, you know, and it just kind of speaks to why wouldn't you have someone around that had a, a profound impact? It sounds like for you. Sure, no doubt. You know, um, you know, everybody's jockeying for information. You know, uh, True. Um, they just want to make sure uh, you know the information doesn't uh, get mixed. You know, because everybody's with the. Uh, well, a lot of the teams are going with the the one philosophy, um, all hands on deck, um, with new world order type stuff, right? And so, um, you know, when the old veteran guy comes in, man, he wants to share what he did when he played, not to try to, you know, get sideways with the organization. And I think a lot of clubs see that as, you know, uh, a negative. But, you know, it's it's cool. <laughs> we, 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 we're, we're very fortunate in the game. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of you know richness to baseball uh, and the history of the game, but the people who played the game and uh, you know we 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 used to love the Giants clubhouse at spring training. Willie Mays would set up a table there, and players would circle around them and and visit with them. Of course, uh, COVID's kind of cut down some of that, but just the pleasure of you know the Jeff Kent, Barry Bonds coming back together, Ellis Burks. Uh, Rich Aurelia, J.T. Snow, uh, Robbie Thompson, just bringing guys back and, and getting them in the clubhouse again and around these guys. And um, so what, what, what are you up to now? What's, what's, what's uh, keeping you busy? And, and I know you, we mentioned the book, but what, what else is going on and, and what, what, what happened after baseball? Oh, cool. Yeah. So, um, well, right now I am uh, got into community outreach with the uh, Texas Rangers. And so I was uh, hired away from the Rangers um, uh, by a construction company here in the state of Texas uh, that was creating a new division. They, you know, thought I could impact. So, uh, but as you guys know, the last five, seven years, there's just, you know, camps and clinics, you know, have just taken off and perfect game events and, Man, I mean, the summers are just to die for now. You know, opportunities to stay sharp, uh, work with kids, uh, work with young players, um, and still, you know, be around some of the alumni. You know, through like, you know, like I have on my Hank Aaron Invitational shirt here. Uh, there you, go. you know, nice. you know, so uh, you know, my my days, well, my years are full of just um, you know work here in Texas, but uh, this allows me to. Uh, get out and, you know, stay around baseball, stay around coaching, uh, learning more and more about uh, this baseball data, which seems to be, you know, it's not going anywhere. So mm -hmm. you either get in it or get left behind. Right, right. Well, I hope you, I hope yeah. you stay around. You have a lot of, lot of great information stories to share. I wanted to ask you just one more. Uh, Hank Aaron, was he, did, did you ever meet Hank? Hank was my, one of my idols growing up. And I got, a, I, I remember where I met him. 
remember when, you know, when it was, it was a, it was a dinner in New York city and he was one of the guests there. And, 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 you know, it was just had, he had such an, a profound impact in my, in my, uh, just even I met him three, three different times, the, the humility that he had for the, the iconic player that he was. Did you ever get a chance to, to meet him along the way? I never met him. Um, but uh, man, I had a great deal of respect for him, as you can imagine. Uh, so, you know, it's people like that. You kind of, you never want to let down as a player. Mm. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very tough, Bobby, to, very yeah. tough to, yeah, I was just going to say tough to lose Hank Aaron for all of us as, as, as baseball fans, but just the, the, the legacy of Hank Aaron, the, the, you know, the, what he represents about the game. I mean, just, you know, looking back at pictures of him, even Luther King or the fact he, uh, you know, knew, he, you know, he knew Jackie Robinson and just all those connections, you know, and you, you lose Hank and you lose those stories, but just great memories and great lessons and, and hard. I mean, it was a tough, tough loss. It wasn't expected by those of us you know, to know, you know, at least last I heard he was doing the, um, you were cutting out there at the end. I don't know. Was that could yeah, could you hear him end? at the end there, huh? Just to, just towards no, the end sorry. a little bit. Yeah, no, I missed the end piece. Oh, there he goes. He's gone. Yeah. All right. So yeah. it's just you and I for the last. So so tell me, uh, Homer, before uh, before we uh, sign off, um, is there a story that? that you that you uh, haven't shared yet that 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 um <laughs> sticks out in your mind because you you had some good ones i love yeah. the strawberry story because we had stra we're, we had strawberry on about two weeks ago i've known daryl for a long time since he's a former met and he's he's really changed his life around he's he's a he's a preacher now and a, a public speaker and uh, really really good at it and he's given back in that way so you know but I'm, you know, I'm curious, is there a story that, that we didn't ask you about that you want to share? Anything come to mind? Uh, man, I'll tell you what, yeah, I, I, um, I, one I think is really cool, uh, as, and I think you guys can really relate to this story here. So when you're that guy that's on the fence, they don't know if they're going to take you up north or not. And uh, we're going to play an exhibition game in California. And that's when Mr. Steinbrenner, you guys may have heard the story where he got that plane from the Sheik. So guys are, you know, pack, you know, they're packing their boxes. And uh, I'm like, man, I don't know what to do. I know I'm out of options. And so I came home, I went to the apartment in spring training and I asked my wife, I said, man, what should I do? And uh, I met my high school sweetheart, by the way. So it was easy for me to talk to her about this stuff. because She was with me every step of the way. And so okay. just as, Man, as like as strong of a woman as you need, she say, well, did they tell you not to? I say, no. Nah. She say, well, put them on there. They'll, they'll tell you to take them off. <laughs> and so, man, I'm packing up like now. I'm, I'm part of the squad at this point. I'm packing up and, you know, man, I'm feeling good. And sure enough, I get out to California and uh, we do the exhibition. Uh, we're playing uh, Padres and then uh, we go on over to Anaheim. And they haven't told me anything. Day before, we're about to open the season. And I'm passing Joe Torrey in the hallway. And he says, oh, hey, by the way, uh, you made the team. Congratulations. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> so yeah, the, I, uh, I like sharing that story. Because you guys, as you can imagine, man, I was on pins and needles, right? Like, man, I, I, I just didn't know what to think and what to do, which I kind of felt, man, if I've gotten this far, I'm OK. But it would be nice to get confirmation. No doubt. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That is that is good. Hey, do you have your World Series ring with you? Bobby, you have yours, right, with you? Yeah, I, I saw do. that. I yeah. Do. Yeah. I don't have it ready, but. Do you, do, you, do, you wear, do you wear it? I wear it, like, to dinner and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. anything to make someone say, "Hey, man, nice ring. What you what you got there? Where's that? Let me see, let me take a look at it. Can I can I try it on?" Yeah, yeah. As you can imagine, I'm I'm drinking, you know, most of the night like this, right? Like, <laughs> the thing doesn't gl it doesn't shimmer in the light at all. Those rings, yeah. those diamonds. Which which year is that, Bobby? That you're wearing tonight? Uh, 2014. 
You got 14. Man. Yeah, that's 14. pretty cool, man. He's, cool. he's got a couple to choose from, Homer. I, I yeah, don't have I know, any. right? <laughs> I've got my little piddly 2000 World's uh, NLCS ring here. We won the uh, – with the Mets, we won the National League. Uh, we actually we beat Bobby that year, thankfully. That's right. And so yeah, that's so right. we get the. Yeah. I mean, that's that's that is pale in comparison to the World Series ring right there. <laughs> yeah. Look at that thing. Yeah. I, I can't even put that on with if you have a World Series ring on. No shoot, those are hard to get. No, they're not. None of them are they easy. Are none they're of them are easy. Right. No, We've all been in the game guys, a long time. I just have a quick question. A friend of mine, uh, he knows I'm going to be on with you guys, and he just told me to ask. Is there a trade that you did not make that you regret? And you may have spoken about this already in the past, but like. You, you want to go, Bobby? Yeah, I've got a couple that will come up to mind, but I got well, one in particular. Well, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, there's, there's a, uh, I mean, one that we were trying to make, it wasn't our choice not to make it, but we were trying to get, uh, I think it was, uh, I think it was Cole Hamels to mm. waive his no trade so he would come to us. And we thought for sure he'd want to come to our ballpark. I mean, it's a, it's a great place to play, but, um, but you know, he had, he had his sights set elsewhere and, uh, and we were unable to get him. And I, so I, there's a lot of regret that we weren't able to get him, but you know, at some level we, we couldn't control that. And that happened similar with G and Carlos Stanton. I mean, we, we actually made a trade with the Marlins, you know, agreement, but it was pending his approval. Meanwhile, uh, Michael Hill, juggling every opportunity made a, another deal with the Cardinals. So he, so he gave Stanton the choice giants or Cardinals. Cause I got two deals. I'll go either way. And Stanton said, well, I'm hearing the Yankees have interest. So I'm going to wait and see if, if you can get a deal done with them. Wow. Well, we know what happened. Um, so, yeah. you know, close calls, but you know, no cigar. Those wow. are good ones. I had one in when I was with the Orioles, uh, Miguel Tejada was right towards the end of his, his uh, prime. Mm -hmm. and it was 06 season and we weren't going anywhere that year and um we had a deal with the angels the angels were in the playoffs that year going to the playoffs bill stoneman was the general manager and they had bartolo Colon as their rotation irving santana was a rookie that year um and we had a deal that we could uh, i could do irving santana and eric ibar who was their who was a young shortstop at the time um and we could add a, a, a relief pitcher as, as well, who we liked, our scout really liked. And my owner asked, said, listen, that's not enough for Miguel Dejade. You have to ask for Casey Kochman too. Mm -hmm. And if you remember at the time, Casey Kochman was a good player, first baseman could really hit. So in essence, I was going to get three pre like premium everyday type players, two everyday players plus a, a, a starting pitcher. And I'm like, they're not, they're going to say no. And he goes, no, I want you to ask. And I asked Bill Stoneman and he says, no, you guys are being pigs. We're not going to, we're not going to do this deal. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> he hung up the phone. Wow. So and our, our chances of, tra of trading me out of Hada went down in smoke. We had no chance after that. And I'm like, oh my God, we've got to change the organization path. Cause we had, that was the 13th year of below 500. We, next year we were 14 and then I get replaced by Eddie McPhail. And I'm like, man, I could have, I could have changed the, the, the whole trajectory of the organization with one trade. Yeah. And he was worried about how we were going to, who was going to, who's going to score all the, uh, who's going to drive in all the runs in the, 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 the second half of that season, we were already losing 90 games. We didn't, <laughs> didn't matter who was, you know, we were still going to lose 90. It didn't matter who's driving in runs. It was gonna, so anyway, I didn't win that uh, discussion with, uh, with my owner. And I'm sure Bobby has stories like that too. That's just for sure. sometimes those deals you, you push too hard and, um, and you know, and the other side goes, no, nah, it's not. That's not fair. Now, <laughs> you had a lot of leverage, but I'm not going to go that far. We're out. So, yeah, I don't even yeah. know if they traded for anybody. He offered me Bartolo Colon that year, um, and Eric Ibar, and we said no because we were a little concerned about Bartolo's um, elbow at the time. That he had some health issues. He had a little bit uh, bigger contract, and we want. You know, I thought that the 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 uh, lesser contracted guys, the minimum salary type guys were more valuable. Even then, I, you know, we thought they were more valuable uh, for where we were at the time. So we said we passed on Bartolo and we pushed on Santana. And I tell you what, our scout, Dave Engel, 
was really he was right on he he had those guys he knew he he gave me all the right players and and we had the deal done so anyway wow yeah that's awesome. that was it that yeah. was it yeah good question though yeah oh. good question well homer we always appreciate getting together and talking baseball the first time we've ever been around each other i've always heard good things about you i know bobby has too so thank you for the time i hope you get back into the game because you need to be talking baseball and maybe it doesn't work personally i get it um and i'm going to look forward to reading your book your books is called hitting low in the zone bobby had mentioned it earlier but uh, we'll try to get some uh, some information out on that too see if we can get you know, increase the sales a little bit too Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Man, hey, honored big time, man, because I, I bet we could talk baseball all day. So All day. Uh, well, man, we'll stay in time. touch because we got some things that we're working on. And maybe we can do some things down there with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Man, that would be awesome. Hey, take awesome. care. Be well. Okay, Homer. Hey, thanks for the time.